Friends, we are so excited to welcome once again Sammy Rodriguez. Come on. He's going to preach the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help him, God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You may be seated. You may be seated. Once again, I'm truly honored to be with you and uh, Pastor Steve and Pastor Sharon. You're simply the best. You really are. You really are. Thank you for creating space for this uh, Hispanic American from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I was raised in Bethlehem. That's why I have a messianic complex. <laughs> now living in California for 20 years. But man, I'm honored to be here indeed. I... I have one question for you, and I'm, I'm going to tell you where this stems from, uh, this entire narrative. It's actually, I want to teach a little bit more this morning and, and share with you something that happened. This past summer, and it's a 1 Corinthians 15, 10 moment indeed, uh, arguably on steroids, by the grace of God, we, have an, we had an opportunity this summer. Did anyone here watch the movie Breakthrough? If you saw it, raise your hand. So let me tell you how that movie got on the screen. I was on, an, and this is tangential completely to what I'm going to share this morning. I was on a flight coming from Dallas, and I did an, a feed on my phone in January of 2015. And the feed was the following. Uh, it was from the St. Louis Dispatch newspaper, and the feed was, Boy dies, mom prays loudly, boy comes back to life. So I did my due diligence, and I found out, in, in a matter of 24 hours, the story of a, of a boy who had uh, fell through the ice. He was playing around, horsing around, and he, he broke through the ice of his two friends. He was underwater for 15 minutes, January in Missouri. And if you're from the Midwest, Missouri. And he broke through the ice. He, was, he, he died. Uh, he was underwater for 15 minutes of a big lake. They finally took him out. First responders, for another 45 minutes, they try to resuscitate him, completely dead, brain dead, heart dead, completely dead. And then another eight minutes subsequently, for an hour and eight minutes, this boy was completely medically verifiable, no exaggeration, no hyperbole, dead. Mom walks in. Mom walks into the hospital room, and she just wrapped up doing a Bible study, a Beth Moore Bible study. And she walks into the hospital room. Doctor looks at her and says, we tried, the kid's been dead for over an hour, just say goodbye to the corpse, you know, we'll give you some time. And they waited right here. She walks in, doesn't say anything other than the following, Holy Spirit, bring my son back to life. Now, in full disclosure, I did not yell. She did. Because the, the initial report, these are not Christian newspapers now, the initial report was that she yelled and prayed so loudly, this is the quote, not mine, that everyone in the emergency floor Heard her cry. Holy Spirit, bring my son back to life. Not five minutes later, not four minutes later, not three minutes later, not two minutes later, not even a minute later. The moment she put a period on bring my son back to life, every apparatus in that room turned on right there simultaneously across the plane. I just want to remind you, miracles still happen. I, let me say that one more time. Miracles still happen. Jesus still saves. He still delivers. Jesus is still in the healing business. Believe that. That's not hype, man. He's still healing and setting the captive free. This stuff is real. It's not some mystical stuff out there. It's, there really is power when you call out the name of Jesus. So it happened. So I read the story. And the story of a man named Brady. I read the story. And I read it. And I went, all right. So on Monday on my television program, on, on a television network, on TBN, I started, you know, just knowing what I read, just sharing it. And then I shared it again at our church. And all of a sudden, I get a DM in, in, uh, in, an, in the old school platform for the older folk, Facebook. And I get a DM in Facebook. And the DM is, Pastor Sam, I've been following your ministry for years. I'm a fan. Um, I'm the lady you just talked about on television. I'm the mom. But she said, respectfully, respectfully, sir, you're shortchanging me. So I wrote back, and, and, and I, have, I have a media team who, like, you know, does the whole thing. But on that one, I came in and went, like, because it's me on television saying something. I want to make sure, did I get the facts wrong? Oh, no, you're undercutting the What do you mean I'm undercutting the facts? 
You stated on your television program that my son was completely dead for 15 minutes. My son was completely dead for one hour and eight minutes. And I have the medical documentation to substantiate it. So I wrote back, are you sure this is medically verifiable? I'm not doubting your integrity, but are you sure this is? She went, if you're interested, call me. I called her up, Joyce Smith. Joyce, are you serious? Top doctors, I could give you everything, their numbers, cell numbers, email. So all of a sudden, I get all the data. Holy Spirit hits me and says, Samuel Rodriguez, you're going to make this story into a movie. The only problem is I have no connections with Hollywood. <laughs> I, could I can't even barely spell Hollywood. And, and, and then in my earlier preaching years, I started preaching when I was 14 years of age. And in my early preaching years, I was so naive and caught up in my theological, my alpic worldview that I would say silly stuff about Hollywood. So I would have to go back and repent for all the stupid stuff I ever said. <laughs> stuff like Hollywood is of the devil. No, it is not. It's not. Don't curse the stuff that God's going to use to bless the world. Sure, there are things that come out of Hollywood and media, of course, that, we're not, that, that do exacerbate darkness, but not all of it is contaminated. There are redemptive threads in absolutely all of these constructs. So, so all of a sudden, I go, how do I do this? God told me to make it into a movie. God told me to make it into a movie. And, and, and I'm struggling with the whole, how do I make it into a movie, man? Seriously. Like, I have, we have campuses in L.A. and everything, but I'm not connected to the industry. I'm more in the political, social, cultural realm. Not the whole, how do we get the, the whole, how, me, what, how? So all of a sudden, I have a good friend, and he happens to be a friend. He was a friend. He was a hangout buddy, like a Christmas come home, have some Puerto Rican food dinner buddies, which is a guy named Devon Franklin, who is married to a woman, an actress named Megan Good. So Devon and Megan, they, we know them as friends, and, we, and just hangout buddies, and yeah. And Devon would preach at church every year, because he's a great speaker. But he also happens to be a Hollywood producer. By coincidence. <laughs> so I called the bond. I didn't want to be that guy. That guy, right? And I struggled. I don't want to be that guy. It's going to be awkward. He's, he'll turn it down. You know, like our friendship will still survive. But I don't want him to. It's just the, the whole awkwardness. So I gave him a call. I said, Devon, here's a story. Woman, you know, son. Son dies. Here's medically verifiable. But, and he shrugged me off. And he gave me the, you know, the quintessential placating sort of patronizing response. I'll think about it which is, I'm not going to do anything about it whatsoever. So all of a sudden, I said, I'm not, Holy Spirit said, make it into a movie. So I, I, I just felt the bond was the person. So I brought them to my television program, put them in the green room. I had, at that time, uh, a caramel macchiato. I, I was, I'd been redeemed from that, no longer caramel macchiatos. Now it's matcha green tea latte uh, with almond milk because it's a lot healthier, by the way, and, and even more than soy. Soy has to, that's, that's the point. That's, don't just, so I, I put him in my green room. I had Devon in my green room. By coincidence, I invited Joyce and the boy that resurrected. <laughs> By coincidence, on the same day, on my television program, and I happened to put him in the green room, one green room, not separate, on that day. And by coincidence, I had to leave the room for a while <laughs> with my camel macchiato. So I'm walking out of the room, and I go, Holy Spirit, it's in your hands. Do your thing. Left them, set them up, brought them on the television program. By the end of that program, Devon stands up from the couch right there. We were live in the air. He stands up, looks at me, and says, Samuel, shook my hand. We're going to do your movie. That's how the breakthrough movie came out. And it is the first major motion picture, 20th Century Fox. This is good, with great due deference to Pure Flix, my friends. This is not Pure Flix. This is 20th Century Fox. This is the first, do your due diligence on this. It is the first major secular movie ever where the main character is the Holy Spirit. And, and it landed. It, we, it was a hit. We were, we were up there in the top three movies competing with Marvel, with the Avengers, with Shazam. I mean, here we are, a Christian film about the power of God. What does this have to do with the proverbial price of chicken? I'm going through the red carpet. I have an interview and, and a press hit with all media. The New York Times even gave us uh, an affirming critique of the movie. With la, la sangre de Cristo, man. You, we are in the last days the New York Times actually liked a movie about the power of the Holy Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is coming again. So I'm asked, 
going through the media. These are secular media interviews. And they're going, as executive producer uh, Samuel Rodriguez, you know, what, how, do you, how, how in the world, what's the secret? Like, what's the secret? What's the secret sauce? How do you actually get this done? What does it take? What kind of life do you need to live? And, and it's not that I've lived it perfectly. I'm going to get into that in a second. But what kind of outline? What does it take? It, here we have a movie that's about the Holy Spirit. And it's the first time, the first time, first time, first time. What does it live? And this was a response I gave secular me. I'm going to give it to you. And that's what I want to share with you here briefly in an expedited manner. Here it is. My response was, so you're t and she says, the so you're talking about changing the world. I said, yeah, if you really want to change the world, Live a holy, healed, healthy, happy, humble, hungry, honoring life. Let me say that one more time. Live a holy, healed, healthy, happy, humble, hungry, honoring life, and you will change the world. The seven H's. Live a holy. Somebody say holy. holy. Healed, healed. Healthy. Happy. happy humble. Hungry, hungry. Honoring life. And change the world. These are the seven H's for a limitless life. If you want to live a life without limits, live a holy, healed, healthy, happy, humble, hungry, honoring life, and you will change the world. Let me ask you, really, how many really believe they can change the world? Raise one hand. How many desire to change the world? I assure you, this is a biblical antidote, a biblical rubric, for lack of a better phrase, where if you live this kind of life, you will change the world around you. It'll happen. Let me begin with, with the, the first one. And I, I can't go through all of them because the time-wise, just hit two or three of them. And number one is holiness. Somebody say holiness. holiness. Holy people change the world. I'll say that one more time for the hearing impaired. Holy people change the world. And holiness still matters. Now, I'm, I'm going to put this in perspective because this word causes acid reflux. In our 21st century context... To some, that's just like, buy me my prize, like, because this stuff is, it's misconstrued, it's misunderstood, it's mishandled. But holiness is one of the most beautiful, redemptive, and transformative concepts in all of existence. Holiness is not legalism. Holiness is not adherence to dogma. Holiness is not an Old Testament relic barely surviving in the world of vertical grace and horizontal relativism. Holiness is not a rigid set of rules outlining the fullness of Christian prohibition. Holiness is not restrictive. Holiness does not handicap you. Holiness is the character of God the Father. It is the clarion call of God the Son. And it is the caption of God the Holy Spirit. Holiness emancipates you. It sets you free. It beautifies you. It is the quintessential magnet for God's favor. 1 Peter 1.16, be holy for I am holy, says the Lord, to be or not to be. Hebrews 12.14, work at living in peace with everyone and work at living that holy life. Let's, let, me, let me conduct the holiness test. I'm going to give you right now exegetically extrapolated Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic definitions of holiness from Genesis to Revelation. And tell me whether or not this is you. This is according to Scripture. Here's what to, to be holy. Here it is. If you're devout, pious, blessed, righteous, moral, just, good, angelic, godly, venerable, immaculate, pure, spotless, clean, blameless, humble, saintly, innocent, godlike, saintlike, perfect, faultless, uncorrupt, undefiled, untainted, upright, virtuous, incorrupt, revered, and dedicated to the service of God, that makes you holy. All the holy people here, raise your hand. All the holy people here, raise your hand. See, th th that's the issue, which you proved me right. You, you, respectfully, I love y'all, but you got to get over yourself. Because what if I tell you right now, if you're born again here, raise your hand. If the blood of Jesus washed you, raise your hand. If your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, raise your hand. L let me just correct your theology a bit. If you answered yes to all the last questions I just gave you, believe it or not, you are holy. You really are. Listen, holiness is about identity. It's, it's not do holy, it's be holy, First Peter. 
which means holiness is a state of being. Holiness is not what you do. Holiness is who you are. I wish you would get this this morning because your life is about to be radically shifted. By the time this session is over, you're going to walk out believing that you are a holy child of the living God. What makes you holy is not what you do for God. What makes you holy is what God did for you. That's what makes you holy. It's the saving grace of Jesus that makes you holy. It's the cleansing blood of Christ that makes you holy. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit that makes you holy. Your words, your efforts, your actions, your interactions do not make you holy. They reflect who you already are, a holy child of the living God. So understand this, you are holy. So if I would go back to that list, you need to walk out knowing that you are a holy child of God. Do you, I grew up in a strict Pentecostal church. When, and I'm just in my... I'm not that old, man, and even in my, because in the Latino Pentecostal, we were like 20, 30 years behind. In my straight Pentecostal church growing up in the 1980s, my, they would preach, if you are in the movie theaters, and Jesus would come back. <laughs> you will be left behind. Do you know how many things I left behind because I was afraid of being left behind? It was just jacked up. It was messed up. It was, it was, it was the Old Testament with tongues. It, it, it was a bunch of things I couldn't do until I had a revelation of the grace-filled work of Jesus that set me free. And as a holy child of God, it's not what about I can't do. It's about what I can do. That I can walk in the fullness of the mercy and the love and the purpose and the passion and the promise of everything Jesus laid out for me. So let me ask one more time this morning. Are there any holy people in the house here at the WAVE conference? Holiness is not a byproduct of transactional religion undergirded by the law. It is the child of a transformative relationship underwritten by grace. And if the President of the United States would ever come into a vehicle, if he would take your Land Rover, or respectfully, because we don't discriminate here, your Prius. If, if the President would ever sit in your Prius or your Land Rover, automatically, that car, automatically, by law, becomes property of the U.S. government. Automatically. It's, it's commandeered. It's automatically U.S. government property, and it becomes the presidential mobile because the presence of the person defines the identity. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, inside of you, you don't just have anything. You don't have an ideology. You don't have a construct. You don't have religion. You don't have an idea. You don't have a thought. Inside of you, you have... The presence of the Spirit of the living God. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. The Spirit of God. Not just any spirit, but the Holy Spirit of Almighty God. By the way, Romans 8, 11, it's the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you. That's what makes you holy. Holy. Holy people change the world. 1 Peter 2.9, you are a holy nation, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Raise your right hand. I'm just going to do this. Raise your right hand. I know we're, I got a couple of minutes here, but I just want to do this. Let, let me declare in Jesus' name that you're going to walk out of here understanding you are a holy child of God. And, and you're going to, the author of Hebrews, when he says work every single day, he's actually saying work every single day into the fullness of your identity. Do not be swayed away from what you already are. Become who you already are. Be who you already are. Uh, Peter doesn't say, you will be a holy nation. You are a holy Raise your right hand. Here it is. So let me speak to you prophetically if that word troubles you. Whatever. So l l let me speak to you prophetically. Your children will not inherit your sins. Your children will inherit your blessings. Because you are a holy child of God. If you believe that, give God the kind of praise this morning that lets him know. Yeah. 
Now look at your neighbor, the one you like the most, and tell him, I am holy. <laughs> tell your other neighbor, the one you barely tolerate. <laughs> and tell that neighbor, I am holy. <laughs> I am holy. By the way, I love, our church is 40%, as I mentioned, 40% well, Caucasian, white, 40% black, 20% Latino, Asian. But I love to have, like, audiences, because when I preach, like, for Bishop Jakes or for Kojic or for something else, and versus preaching for Robert Morris, my friend, it's beautiful because of the dichotomy. Like, in, in different environments, in a, in a multi-ethnic, or in, a, in an African-American or Latino environment, you can say, touch your neighbor. That's cool. Like, they do it all the time. In a completely white crowd, it is the most awkward thing in the world. <laughs> like, white people don't like to be touched at church. Make a note of that. Like, touch your neighbor. White people go like, that's just not me. That's not what we do. We just don't do this. Just... <laughs> oh, I love America. God bless America. We got to hurry. Holy. The second H is healed. You got to live a healed life. Why? Because wounded people wound people. And broken people break people. But healed people heal people. There's power when you're healed. Yeah. To be healed is to be whole, to be complete. The Hebrew word transposed in the New Testament in Aramaic and Latin and Greek is the completion. The Hebrew word would be shalom, to be healed. God wants you healed. And he wants you to heal others. And healing is for the mind, for the body, and for the soul. Healing for relationships. Isaiah 53 verse 5, he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. 1 Peter 2.24, he himself carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we would be dead to sin and live for righteousness. That's, that's, that's a synonym for holiness, by the way. Our instant healing flowed from his wounding. Psalm 147, verse 3, he heals the brokenhearted and binds their wounds. This world is broken, ladies and gentlemen. It's broken. I do believe in the power of healing. And I do believe, and I've lived it. Again, I'm a Penn State, Lehigh University guy, math guy, doubted the stuff I saw at church. Um, I, I, again, I'm, I'm obsessed with mathematics. Calculus is the language of God. And calcu it is, and calculus is, calculus and mathematics, calculus is like the speaking in tongues for math. <laughs> it's the highest thing you could do in prayer language. I mean, this is, so all the people that hate math right now are going, no, stop that. But I've, I've experienced and I've seen it, the healing power of God. I gave you the story of, of that boy, John Smith and Joy Smith, the only medically verifiable resurrection story in modern history. But it's not just limited to a kid in Missouri. There's healing in the name of Jesus. It really does take place. And, and, and it's out there. The miracles are there. Matter of fact, let me ask you, if you personally, are, if you, not that someone told you, if you've experienced healing in your life or in the life of someone in your nuclear family or in your inner circle, that you know that you know that you know it was a God thing, raise one hand. Wow. Look at the hands. Ladies and gentlemen, not just physical healing, but mental, emotional healing. All complete healing. James 5, first of all, Acts 10, 38 is specific. Jesus of Nazareth was anointed by God with the Holy Spirit with great power. He did wonderful things for others. Divinely healed all those who were under the tyranny of the enemy. For God had anointed him. The, the, uh, the purpose of the enemy is to sicken you. And, and we have to, as a church, without getting weird about it, we don't have to get, like, showboatish about it. There's a way that we can un unleash the power of God to heal. And again, it doesn't have to have all the drama hype stuff that turned off an entire generation because there was a bit of exuberance. Not a bit, a lot of exuberance. And it was more about the personality and the fashion and the show. And, but we, we don't need to do that, man. Like right now, as I speak right now, I'm not, there, there's healing power in this place. And it's not, Pastor Sam, is that real? I've seen it. There's healing power in this place. I'm going to tell you a story no one's ever heard because it happened here at this conference right there. First day I'm about to preach. I'm about to preach here the first night. And I'm seated there, and all of a sudden, we get this, this crazy cost and then text. My daughter, Yvonne, my daughter, Yvonne's pregnant. And we, we've never had this before ever happen to us, ever, ever. So it's not, you know, we don't do drama. We do destiny. So we're not that kind of, so we get this text, and it says, pray. Yvonne's rushed to the hospital. The doctor believes she's pregnant now. How many months is she? 
four months. We never got this before. This is right before I preached, like the first night here. I'm right there. And Yvonne is being rushed to the hospital. It looks like she has meningitis. And I'm going, what just happened? I'm seated right there. I'm about to preach on Be Light. I'm about to come up. And I'm looking at mom, and we're looking. We left the room. We come down here, and, 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 and we're parents. And I'm full of the Holy Spirit. I love Jesus, and I believe the word of God, but I'm still a dad. So I'm going to keep it real. I'm still a dad. And I'm, and I'm quasi jacked up. Jacked up is a theological term for jacked up. <laughs> and I'm jacked up. I really am going, like, how am I going to preach this? I've never, you know, like, I haven't been down this road before. Like, what just happened? And so I'm about to come up, and God is my witness. I wouldn't play with this. Holy Spirit hit me and said, son, what did I tell you? I just, I told you everything's going to be all right. So the moment I looked at my wife and said, look at me, we had a moment through the breakthrough movie that we, there was a lot of spiritual warfare and I had an encounter with God that was pretty supernatural. So I reminded my wife right there, seated, I said, God said everything's fine. So help me God. Right after I said that, we get a text message right before pastor called me up here and said, no meningitis, everything is fine, everything is clear, doctor just checked. <laughs> So right now, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I am de believing God for healing in every single circumstance. Right now, in this, this morning session, the healing virtue of Jesus is in this place. So I speak to every vestige of diabetes, and I command it to flee in the name of Jesus. And I speak to every issue that's heart-related, and I command it to flee. How about this? Cancer, shrivel up right now. Right now, in the name of Jesus, whatever medical condition, whatever physical condition, whatever relationship condition, be healed in the name of Jesus. I want you to look up here for a second. The healing component is critical, but there's a narrative, there's a narrative in the Gospel of Mark that I need you to reference real quick regarding healing, because it is a, a, a revelation indeed. The story of Jesus crossing over the lake, Mark chapter 5, 22 to 42, and it's a story, Jesus crosses over the lake, and there's a man named Jairus who meets him, and this man named Jairus says this, watch this, my daughter is dying. My daughter is 12 years old and she's dying. And I believe that if you reach her, she will be healed. So Jesus goes en route to heal a 12-year-old girl. All of a sudden, as he's en route to heal a 12-year-old girl, a woman who has nothing to do with the price of chicken shows up. Not invited to the party, not part of the narrative, this, just this external character, not part of the script. This woman who had been sick for 12 years. The child was 12. She was sick for 12 years. She had an issue, the woman with the issue of blood. This woman, an older generation, and she had spent all her money. Things were getting worse. She breaks through the crowd. Jesus is not even looking at her. And she touches the hem of his garment. And she gets healed. Now, I want to put this in perspective. Watch this. It, you can't separate the story. This is an older woman from an older generation who touched Jesus and was healed. And then Jesus continued and brought life to the next generation. I'm going to give you a word right now. When our generation touches Jesus, when our generation gets healed, the next generation will be set free by the power of Jesus. Are you getting this right now? When our generation breaks through the bureaucracy and our constructs and our belief systems that may be archaic and limiting us to the fullness of the experience of the grace-filled work of Christ, when we break through the crowd and the crowd of unbelief and unforgiveness and unrepentance, when we break through the crowd and we touch Jesus, then Jesus will touch the next generation. So I'm, I'm, what am I telling you? I'm telling you I'm believing you to be healed by the time this thing is over today. But not only that, put a smile on your face. You no longer need to worry about your children and your children's children and your children's children's children because they will experience the touch of Jesus. Come on, if you believe that, somebody say amen. Your children and your children's children and your children's children's children will experience the grace-filled touch, the healing touch of Jesus. Healing, 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 healing. We're done. Let me wrap up. Let me wrap up. Holy healed. I'm, I'm, uh, are there any questions? Okay. Holy healed. Healthy is dirt, John 2. Live a healthy life. And the healthy word Greek there is healthy in all aspects. 
Yeah, you get to do that. Order proceeds, overflow. Healthy, live a healthy life. And I mean an action word, deed, and thought in your diet, in, in your environment, in what you take in physically, spiritually, emotionally, in your conversations, in your environment, healthy in all aspects, holistic, comprehensive. I don't have time to break that down, but live a healthy life. Live a healthy life. It behooves you to live a healthy life. And that includes not just your diet physically, but your diet spiritually, morally, especially your environment. Who speaks into you is much more important than who speaks about you. Let me say that one more time. Who, sp who speaks? In when I was immature, and I was, when I was immature, I would worry about who is speaking about me. Once you grow up and you don't give a holy hoot about who's speaking about you, you start worrying and concerning yourself with who speaks into you. Don't give everyone access to your destiny. Don't give everyone access to your dream. Are you with me? Be mindful of who speaks into you and don't care anything at all about who speaks about you. Be healthy. And then let me get into the, the happiness one because then I want to land there and then shoot boom. boom. Happiness, John 15, 11. It's, it's that my joy may be filled in you. And then if you do the Aramaic, go back to the Greek. There are tangent derivative connotations of that. And the word is unbridled happiness, the phrase, in the Greek exegete of the passage. So it is. It's not like the theology of happiness. It's not like God saved you to make you happy. Yeah. But it is important. It is. Why not be happy? Matter of fact, why aren't you happy? Matter of fact, as a Christian, how can you not be happy? And I wasn't happy. I wasn't. I was doing ministry. I was traveling 227 days a year. Different cities, different planes. I wasn't happy. The necessity of the ministry demands at that time, we, were we, had, we had this crazy mission of trying to bring the Latino church in America together. <laughs> Good luck with that. Um, but in the beginning, we actually, by the grace of God, have 42,000 churches now, so it, ha it happened. But in the beginning, it was just denominations, the Baptists, and the and the and the and the, and the, charis the automatics and the charismatics. I mean, you need the different, the different streams and the Mexicans and the Puerto Ricans, and the Salvadorians, the, the Pupusaco and Mofongo. It's a lot of stuff, man. It's a it's pretty complicated. So I was out, and here's a true story. God is my witness. I would alive. Integrity, that holiness stuff means everything. She was there. It's Friday afternoon. She drops me off Sacramento Airport. It's about 2006, around this around that time. She drops me off, and we're in the car. This is the conversation that took place. Correct me if I'm wrong. Look at me, Eva. The word happiness will be a word that will never, ever come out of your mouth to describe me, and it will never come out of my mouth to describe myself. I will never be happy. I have discovered that this is my cross to bear. That I can't be happy. Every time I'm aiming towards happiness, something comes and pops the proverbial balloon. So I am going to be somehow miserably satisfied with the reality that I will never, ever be happy. Ever, ever, ever. Look at me. And I'm broken. The travel, the pressure, uh, just the, 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 you name it. So many dynamics at that time in life. And just so much, right? You've never been, I'm the only one that's ever been through anything, I guess. You've never been there. But, and, and, I'm, and I'm questioning God. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Yeah. And I'm questioning God. I'm questioning the reality of God, the existence of God. My math mind kicked in. You know, I'm going, yeah, I'm, everything, you name it. And I'm going, I'm never going to be happy. So I, I'm in the car. I'm about to leave. I go, look at me. Promise me that you're, that you're never going to say you're happy. Promise me. Happy, I looked at her and said, happy, 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 never, ever, ever. No happy, no happy, no happy. Repeat it, say it. She said, I won't, and she's crying. She said, I won't. I go, whatever. Never going to be happy, never going to be happy, never going to be happy. So I slammed the door and went to South Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina. Preached at a River of Life church. Finished preaching, Saturday conference, Sunday conference, Sunday afternoon service. I'm walking out, about to catch my flight back to Cali. Woman walks in. This is before anyone could Google my name, before Google, before all of that. 
this woman comes up to the middle and says, Pastor says, you're Pastor Sammy. And I went, yeah, you, but you know that because I just preached here. She went, sorry, man, I missed your preaching. I just got here. I go, all right. She goes, but you're Pastor Sammy? I go, yeah, I'm Pastor Sammy. And she says, whoo, gotcha. I go, okay. And I'm looking around like awkward, right? She says, I just got here. I go, yeah, I got that point. And she goes, well, I, and I, I just barely made it. I go, okay, I'm on my way out. Unfortunately, you could get the DVD or CD or whatever we had back in 2006. And so pick it up. And she goes, no, 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 I don't care. She goes, respectfully, I don't care about your sermon. <laughs> that's the first time I hear that. That's not the, that's not the point regarding the message. So I, so I go like, okay. She goes, I have a word that God gave me for you. I go like, oh, no, man. <laughs> it's honest to God, this is what I'm, I'm, I'm going, cuckoo, cuckoo. Because I'm not in my best place. I'm in my, I'm an I'm a, I'm a evangelical agnostic phase. <laughs> Cuckoo. She goes, I got a word for you. And I go like, yeah, yeah. Listen, there's a deacon there, a pastor, Sam, another Sam, Sam Schneider. Sam, come up here, man. Can you take care of this? She goes, I got a word for you. I go, yeah, yeah. She goes, I came from North Carolina. I go, well, good for you. <laughs> she goes, no, you don't get it. Last, do you realize yesterday morning, the Holy Spirit woke me up, told me to get on the internet, at that time the World Wide Web, <laughs> and look for Samuel Rodriguez speaking. So I, so I, I looked at different places, and God said you're speaking in Columbia, South Carolina. I don't know you from anyone. I was on television back then, nothing back then. So she, and I, I looked for you. I called church by church. I called the Baptists and, and the Church of God, Assembly of God, I called God to see him. Finally, after all the calls, this church said there's a Sammy preaching, and it was Sammy Rodriguez. That's why I'm here, because God told me this early this morning, there's a Sammy preaching in Colombia that I have to give a word to. So I'm looking at her going like, you got to be kidding me. And I go, all right, lady. What's the word? She goes, well, here's my pastor's name. She gave me the name, someone you would recognize, by the way. And I went like, okay. He's, I'm an elder in the church, so I'm not crazy. <laughs> like being an elder in the church does not make you crazy. <laughs> Watch, watch. And she goes, she goes, all right, all right, all right I get it. She, I got a word. I go, go ma'am, I have to leave to catch my flight. What's your word? She goes, again, this is my pastor. I go, I get who your pastor is. You can call him. Not interested. Because I'm not crazy. I go, okay. What's your word? She goes, but what I'm going to say right now is going to sound crazy. I go like, oh, ma'am. Now I'm getting flustered, right? I'm going like, I really have to leave. So, ma'am, respectfully, please. She went, all right, Samuel, this is the word of the Lord for you. I've never given this before. I go, ma'am, just say it for the love of God. <laughs> all right, I'm going to say it, Samuel. Never done this before. Can you give me your hand? I gave her my hand. She went, Samuel, this is the word of the Lord for you. What's the word, lady? Okay, here it is. Samuel, the Lord says from this moment on, Happy, 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 and the Lord says again, happy, 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 nothing will be able to take away your joy, nothing will be able to put a lid on the joy that comes from God's spirit from this moment on, you and your family will be happy, 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 happy. I'm here to tell someone right now in Virginia Beach that there's holiness waiting for you. There is healing waiting for you. There is happiness. There is hunger. There is humility. There is honor. There is health waiting for you. Embrace everything Jesus did for you. Live a holy, healed, healthy, happy, humble, hungry, honoring life, and let's do one thing together. Let's go change the world. God bless you. God keep you.